please join me in welcoming Josh Ginsburg. Thank you, Bill. Uh, yeah, people, uh, maybe somebody came to my talk yesterday on, on why large carnivores are not doomed. I have uh, a preternatural um, a desire to be optimistic. Um, I think mostly it's deserved. We tend to look at the glass being, you know, half full or half empty. And I like to say I think the glass is one eighth full and rising. Um, and so I just want to run through what I see as if not optimistic, certainly in the longer term optimistic trends that are, are indicative that we will um, get through climate change, uh, not without tremendous disruption, and you guys are on the front lines of that. I think the, the core problem is that the planning cycle is longer than the political cycle, and the political cycle is so short that you just blink and it's, you know, you're on to the next one. And getting through this requires something different than that kind of short-termism. All right. So I want to just quickly review where we are on the trajectory and then, and then give you five reasons to be optimistic. All right, so uh, you guys have, I'm sure, heard the word the Anthropocene. Uh, my undergraduate degree was in geology, so I like epochs and, and geolo geological time. And there's a lot of question about when it started, but fundamentally it's, it's when we can see a geo geological signature that says humans are, are having impact at a global scale. Um, you can go back 10,000 years to the extinction of many very large mammals. Uh, you can go back to uh, the industri you know, early industrial uh, age of, of 1800 when we started putting stuff into the atmosphere. Or you can look for radionucleotides from nuclear testing in the 50s. Right? And these are all different signatures that we see. Um, I am extremely fond of this data set, and I will talk about it again. It's the Keeling curve. Uh, uh, Ralph Keeling. Um, uh, started this, and his son uh, is now uh, running it. For 53 years, every week they have taken samples on Mauna Loa, looking at CO2 concentrations. As you see, there's a seasonal uh, bit to it, but it's been inexorably going up, uh, and it continues to go up, although perhaps slightly more slowly than it has been. Uh, but this is one of the two long-term data sets that tracks the consumption and burning of fossil fuels, and I'll talk about the other one later. Um, you know, as we look at this, fuels, fossil fuels uh, are, are really the greatest uh, contributor to anthropogenic CO2 emissions. There is a, a chunk um, that comes from deforestation, uh, and we can address that by replanting trees. Uh, but if we don't stop burning fossil fuels or reduce burning of fossil fuels, we're in trouble. Um, if you look at, you know, the impacts of this, land and sea surface temperature, uh, you can be deny this, but the data are pretty strong. Uh, from the fifth intergovernmental panel on climate change. They're working on the sixth assessment. The national assessment came out in November, uh, and things are not getting any better. Um, you know, the probability of being affected by an extreme climate event uh, has gone up significantly over the last 30, 40 years. Um, and this is, again, uh, I'm not sure if this is still on the NOAA website. I saw somebody from NOAA, and maybe they can tell me. Uh, but I thought this was a really great graphic because it summarizes you know, 10 key indicators uh, of a warming climate. And, you know, some of them are indicators that don't have direct bearing on us here on the East Coast, but have huge indirect bearing. So uh, snow cover going down, glaciers going down um, uh, are, are indirect but severe, right? And others, you know, ocean heat content uh, probably has a direct bearing, Arctic sea ice indirect. But these 10 different indicators are, are such that if three of them went one way and seven went the other, on a sign test, a nice statistical test, it would still be significant. And all 10 are going in the right direction. So it's a really nice way when people say, how do you know climate change is real? You can say, well, there are 10 things that we can measure that are happening, and all of them are going in the direction that we thought they'd be going in. All right, so let me continue to depress you a little bit more. Um, the institution formerly known as the Environmental Protection Agency is, is full of people still trying to protect the environment against all odds. Um, you know, uh, we have a climate denier at the head of the EPA, which is a cognitive dissonance that is just extreme. Um, we are trying to unwind the Obama climate policies. Interestingly, the good news is that our, you know, system of government is slow to react, both positively and negatively. The good news is that environmental defense, NRDC, Earth Justice, and others, the New York State Attorney General's Office, the Maryland State Attorney General's Office, are doing a good job of suing the federal government, 
not to stop these things, because in the end, administrative law will win at some level, uh, because they'll just do another review and they'll interpret it differently and we'll, we'll, we'll change that. You all know that, you do it for a living. But we can slow down the process. And we can slow it down enough so that if this is a four-year administration, it will have devastating consequences, but not irreversible consequences. Right? If it's an eight-year administration, all bets are off, right? Um, uh, you know, scrapping the climate accord, again, anybody know the day on which we leave Paris, the Paris Accords? The day after the next presidential election. Right? You have to give notice. It's like Brexit. You just can't leave. You have to give notice. Uh, Mike Bloomberg, I think I might have this in here somewhere else. Mike Bloomberg you know, realized there was a $4.5 million um, shortfall on the, Fed, on the U.S. commitment to paying for the Paris Accord, so he wrote a check. Right? Mike Bloomberg can do that, right? Because it takes him, the time it takes him to write a check for $4.5 million is, you know, he earns that on his $35 billion um, wealth, right? So there are things that are happening. So even when we hear the worst news, there is a, 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 a viscosity to action that is useful. Um, you know, if you look at, I think one of the most interesting results is there are a group of people tracking the loss of information off of federal, mostly sites. And it's a little bit scary, but, but what's interesting is there's also a group that just started a few months ago that's looking at where the information shows up on non-federal sites. All right, so the Cary Institute has 31 states for 40 years of the forest inventory analysis data. We have security clearance, so we actually know where the sites are, which is rare. And we have it all on a mainframe. We'll actually have it on 112 parallel processing PCs in our basement, but we're moving it up to IBM Watson. And that is federal data that cannot be deleted now because we have 31 and we're moving towards having all 50 states of the forest, forest inventory analysis data that USDA has kept for years. This is not uncommon. Uh, there are many of us out there legally grabbing data and sequestering it because we don't want to lose these data sets. So if you guys have data sets, right, think about ways you can share them with your colleagues. I'm not asking you to break the law and you know, break secrecy and all that, but think about ways to share them with the column. So uh, this, somebody said doom and gloom. I think you know, in, in, in your introduction, Bill, you said doom and gloom. I, I think the problem with doom and gloom is that it paralyzes us. So I want to move into um, you know, uh, a, a quote uh, as the introduction to the next piece of this. Uh, Philip K. Dick, one of my favorite authors, said reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. Neil deGrasse Tyson has modified this into another equally wonderful saying. But fundamentally, I think whether we are living in a time in which science is debased and unvalued, uh, it doesn't go away. And so keeping long-term data sets going, keeping projections going, looking at FEMA regulations and, and height levels and all that is really important. Um, and so I think we need to remember that science doesn't go away. Um, one of the most bizarre things that has happened in the last two years was the Climate Science Special Report, which is the underlying information on the fourth national climate assessment. Uh, first three were edited by a guy named Jerry Melillo up at Woods Hole. Uh, and Jerry is now working on the next one, but he's doing it with private funding. All right, so go figure. He thought, he, he thought he'd escaped. He was retiring from this, and, and, but he's doing it. This is a federal report, 13 agencies, published when? The 1st of November, 2017. It was leaked in September. The Trump administration didn't have much choice. It was out there. And they published it, and it was a consensus document of scientists across the federal government. And what does it say? Well, you know, climate change is real, and it's accelerating. Uh, you know, these are the things that are going to happen, right? Um, and all the other things we talked about on that NOAA page. Um, and what I think is interesting is, again, you can have a philosophical disagreement about what to do about climate change. And do we do adaptation? Do we do mitigation? What's the most important thing to do? You can have an economic argument about what the best thing to do about climate change is. And you guys as planners, of course, are balancing all these things all the time. I think the one thing that we are getting to the point where we can move past is denying climate change. And so that's not one of my reasons to be optimistic, but I think it is a reason to be optimistic. Increasingly, the smaller and smaller group of people who deny climate change, also known as the Trump administration, are concentrating themselves in a way that is you know, not going to uh, 
be good, but also is going to be irrelevant because we're going to have to start dealing with this at the local and the state level. Corporations have to start dealing with this. And that's where we get into five reasons to be optimistic. Right? Um, the first one is in 2015 and 16, our carbon emissions globally went down a little bit. It went up a little bit in 17, so it's, but the point is carbon emissions are stabilizing. Now it takes a long time for CO2 to work itself out of uh, uh, the global uh, atmosphere. But it's the first time in 50 years that's happened, right? Um, and if you look at the emissions from fossil fuel, um, it's, it's finally, right? And, and you have to look closely, but that's flat, right? And it stayed flat in 16, went up a tiny bit. But fundamentally, um, you know, the developed countries uh, are doing better, but even the developing countries are flattening out, right? Uh, China, not quite, but, but they're accelerating their reductions. Right? So they'll be flattened out within three years. They say by 2020, they'll be flat. So the first step in reducing carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas gases is releasing less of them. Right? Then there are all sorts of things we can do to absorb them. There are mechanical things. There are planting trees. There are lots of things we can do. Seagrass. Um, Bill and I were talking about a program called Seagrass Grows, which is a blue carbon mitigation program that the Ocean Foundation is pushing forward. Um, and again, this is just land use. Um, but if you look at energy, which is the single largest, it's going down fastest. Right? And it's going down fastest for a number of reasons. Right? Um, so U.S. carbon emissions, right, going down, and they keep going down despite changing government. Why is that? Well, uh, if you look at the things that contribute, well, this is looking out into the future. The Clean Power Plan would have done a big piece of it. Fuel standards, again, trying to reverse that. Methane and NOx emissions. Um, energy efficiency. Uh, and California. Right. <laughs> and I want to end with California. I could have done this in reverse because California is an indicator as to how we're going to get to the Paris goals. Right. And so this is a, a Mike Bloomberg op-ed just before the book he and Carl Pope wrote uh, called Climate of Hope came out. And basically he points out that half the coal-fired power plants in this country were decommissioned uh, or switched to cleaner flues, uh, fuels. Um, and, you know, uh, Moody's, another great liberal institution, you know, analyzed that utilities are increasing wind and uh, other um, renewables, uh, leaving inefficient coal plants at risk. Right? So again, you can make a political statement about wanting to help miners. I think there's great value in helping people through major transitions in economies, but we're not going back to coal, particularly not as oil goes up to $60 a barrel, that would make coal more attractive, but solar and wind are you know, competitive at $40 a barrel for oil equivalent. So it's not likely we're going back to coal. Um, and then 81 companies signed the American Business Act on Climate Pledge. So this is, um, in, again, 15th of March 17, so quite recently. And what did they say? Well, these companies are, are you know, small, irrelevant companies like Alcoa, Cargill, Coca-Cola, DuPont, General Mills, some of the biggest corporations in the world. And they have said that they are going to reduce their emissions and their use of, of non-renewable and non-sustainable energy. So you've got corporations doing it. You've got energy driving it. Uh, you've got one of the great industrials who's you know, really worth $30 billion, and he made it all by himself, didn't inherit it. Uh, and one of the great um, uh, radical environmentalists, Carl Pope, ran the Sierra Club for decades. Um, the two of them writing a book together, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall. Um, but they are both, in the end, pragmatists and optimists. And so um, if we look at Climate of Hope, you know, Reggie, right, local, um, you know, uh, it's been renewed and expanded. Pennsylvania may join. New Jersey is back in. Uh, you've got the California cap and trade um, system. You've got the C40, uh, which is a group, again, Mike Bloomberg started, which is looking at urban sustainability. Uh, the future of life is cities. We're at 51, 52% urban. We're looking at 70% urban by 2050. Uh, cities have the great advantage of being relatively energy efficient on a per capita basis. They use a lot of energy, but on a per capita basis, they use less. Um, and at uh, the UNFCCC at Bonn this year, you know, cities, states, and corporations from the United States, even if the federal government uh, didn't have strong representation, the American people did. 
And that was coming, you know, to try to come around how we will meet the Paris Accord targets, even though our, fa our, our, our government says we are out. All right. Um, and so I think the other thing, and this gets into a topic that broke yesterday, so I don't have it in my talk. The other thing is that there are strong reasons to implement a lot of the changes that were proposed in the last administration for health and other co-benefits. So Charlie Driscoll up at Syracuse and a bunch of other people uh, working with the Science Policy Exchange, Truth in Advertising, I'm on their board, so I'm, I'm pumping them, did a set of papers on the uh, co-benefits of reducing carbon emissions and microparticle emissions in the Midwest. Uh, and what it showed was you can, over a decade, reduce premature deaths quite significantly in, in almost all the states around the country, but significantly in places like Texas and Florida, uh, South Carolina. You know, there are political things here that are interesting. Um, so Paris will work, right? Whether or not we are signatory to it, it's going to work unless the rest of the world pulls out. And there is no indication. In fact, there is the countervailing force that suggests that they won't. Second, which is you know, part of this, I mean, I could do one reason to be uh, optimistic about climate change and, and just leave it at that, but it's more fun to say five, right? So part of why Paris will work is that renewables are a value proposition, right? Um, in 2017, 10% of electrical needs were met with renewables, wind and, wind and solar, right? Wind is at seven and growing faster than solar, which really shocked me. Uh, and if you include hydro, it's 17%. So carbon neutral, carbon free, or non-carbon sources are now almost 20% of our energy. Solar voltaic prices have dropped 60% in a decade. Right? So even if you remove subsidies now with oil prices at $70 a barrel, putting in solar and wind is a value proposition. It is cheap. It is long term. I know this because I'm building an 800 kilowatt solar field at the carry. Somebody else is building it. I'm just buying the power. It's a power purchase agreement because we're a nonprofit, so all those good tax benefits don't accrue to us. But they are, I have electricity at 8.1 cents a watt, kilowatt for 25 years with a 2% escalator. And when I signed it, I was buying it for 5.7 cents on a six month contract, and now it's up to 10.2. Right? And, it's going, and, and as a manager, having a fixed cost that is lower than the current cost is a blessing. Right? And so personally, I'm doing this with my institution. I've had solar at my house for a long time. And it just is at a point where it's no longer, you are no longer uh, financially punishing yourself to do this. In fact, the opposite is true. Right? You know, as I said, half of the national total is, is down, uh, and the cost of, of wind per megawatt is $20, and per coal it's 30 And that's not changing. In fact, the coal prices are not going down, and the wind prices are slowly going down. Not as fast as photo photovoltaics, but they're getting there. Right? Uh, and some people say to me, what about fracking? Right? And I think the way we have to think about fracking and natural gas in general is as a bridge. It is not a solution. But we probably have to weigh the global costs of burning oil and coal to the local costs of fracking. And it's a really nasty calculation, and it's certainly not something I want in New York, which has banned it. But fundamentally, it, there is a national, natural gas bridge that will get us to renewables uh, in the next 20 to 30 years. Um, all right, so we've got the first two. All right, now I'm going to shift gears, right? And I want to talk about some biological, because I'm a biologist, and I study carnivores, and I also like fisheries. So I'm going to talk about those two things. It's really important as you look forward to understand that we can reduce risk to other species despite climate change. Because in the end, there's very little we can do about the impacts of climate change on wildlife and, and even on humans, except for reduce other risks. Right, so species survive when their births outnumber their deaths. It's really quite simple. And anybody who's done any modeling of population dynamics knows that births do not have to outstrip deaths by very much for populations to grow quickly. Right? You know, it's the old, if we start getting 5 or 6% on our CDs, everybody will run to CDs because 5 or 6% is not bad. Many wildlife populations can grow at 15, 20% a year if things are going well, but they're in decline because there's pollution threats, there's direct mortality threats, they're you know, hitting, people, hitting animals with cars, there's, um, there's overhunting, there are all sorts of trade issues. 
And so trying to see how animals are doing, and, and animals in many different environments are doing, and whether we are doing a better job now is really important as we move into a period of greater stress through climate change. So, you know, why do we think car car uh, carnivores are doing well? It's uh, the Ronald Reagan approach to science, which is you find an example and then you generalize from the, from the particular, right? Um, uh, those of you who are not around for Ronald Reagan, he was a lovely speaker and he, he was passionate and um, relatively liberal, all things being equal. Um, uh, and so, you know, many of our media, out uh, media outlets uh, lead with um, things that say things could go extinct. I spent many years uh, working on African wild dogs, so I'm going to put them. They are not near extinction. In fact, their numbers are growing again. Uh, and I want to talk a little about whether we're asking the right question. So um, I don't have a lot of uh, slides from my talk yesterday on carnivore recovery, uh, but I think we have to say carnivores are doing better than we thought because, and this is from a paper with a, a, a future co-author, we're working on this kind of approach nationally. This is in the Northeast United States and Southeast Canada. And what it shows is if we take some notional level of abundance before people really hit the scene in North America in a big way. There were Native Americans here, but their population densities were very low. Carnivores, we assume, were doing pretty well. There was a period of time which, which was the period of decline that lasted about 300, 350 years. And then somewhere around 1900, 1950, we hit the nadir or the bottom of the trajectory. And in the last 30, 40 years, Many populations, not all, some of them bottomed out and aren't coming back, so this isn't just carnivores, but caribou and wolverine, so an ungulate and a carnivore, you know, the ecology of the environment changed. Uh, we got warmer and they're just not going to make it back. They need snow. Um, but uh, many of these species are recovering, and I've now got data on 13 carnivores in North America, all of which show very similar patterns. And so the reason we tell this story about carnivore decline, let me just see, um, is because we look to historic numbers and distributions. And we say we've lost 20, 30, 40, 50 percent of the historic range. And isn't that horrible? And the answer is, yeah, that is horrible. But we've, we've, we got down much further. And we are in a, a time of recovery. Isn't that wonderful? And if you ask the question, how do carnivores or ungulates compare to their pristine, and I use it in quotes, historic range, you will get an answer that things are going to hell in a handbasket. If you say, how have we been doing since we consciously passed the Endangered Species Act, passed the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species at the international level and started really making an effort to recover things, we're doing okay. When we put our mind to it, we can do okay. This is true not just in North America, but in Europe. Wolves are recolonizing much of Western Europe from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that. One, most importantly is public acceptance. People don't freak out when they see a wolf now in Europe. That's combined with legal protection. The EU made this much better because you have a single law protecting wolves rather than 28 laws trying to protect wolves. Ungulate numbers are going up because of better management, people moving to cities, um, reduced perverse subsidies for agriculture, and uh, less hunting. Right? So fewer people are hunting. And so you're getting this natural dispersal both of food, dog food and cat food, and dogs and cats, so lynx and wolves and, and foxes. Um, and so they're regaining much of their territory. Oh yeah, and there's a guy named Boitani. Uh, Luigi Boitani has been doing this for 40 years. And so long-term focus, right? He started in the Abruzzo Mountains of Italy, and that population is now spread about most of northern Italy. It's gone into Slovenia to the right and, and France to the left. Um, all right, in the United States, we know a lot about wolf reintroduction, and we hear a lot about Yellowstone. But the real story is, is natural wolf <laughs> recovery in the Midwest, where there are twice as many wolves in the Midwest as there are in the West, or in the lower 48 West, and that was a natural recovery. Right? You don't hear this story, and I don't know why you don't hear this story. A guy named David Meech is mostly responsible for this story, but you don't hear it, um, and I can't figure out why. Now, if you look globally, and this just came out a couple weeks ago, um, the, the sort of key thing here is to show that where you have high per capita income, you have very few large carnivores threatened, and where you have low per capita income, more of them are threatened. But what's interesting is many of these dots would have been up here 30 or 40 years ago. And what it shows is it's not just money. We haven't gotten that much richer in the last 30 or 40 years. So there are cultural changes as well. 
All right. So carnivores in five slides, I hope I can convince you, are doing better than you thought. Um, uh, and so are fisheries. All right. One of the great, and, and the fisheries people in the room are saying, yeah, we know this. One of the great untold stories uh, that NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service really deserves credit for and doesn't get it is that on the whole, we are doing a good job slowly of recovering our fisheries. So if you look at the status of fish stocks and you look at the proportion that are overfished versus uh, the, uh, that are experiencing it versus those that are overfished through time, it's declining, right? which is good. Right? Um, I, only, I, I wanted to save time, so I took the other slide up. And fundamentally, the story is one, it's not, I mean, in the intro uh, for, before people showed up, we, we did another uh, short film which talked about, you know, sturgeon haven't come back, striped bass have. It's not universal. But again, we are doing a better job of recovering and managing our fisheries than we ever have. The long-term impacts of some of the uh, sort of shifts in ecosystem structure, right? Cod may never come back in the northern banks because we have shifted the ecosystem into a system that, that favors uh, invertebrates rather than vertebrates. So things like squid or lobster or crabs might be doing better and cod just can't compete. Now we could reshift it by getting rid of some of the invertebrates and seeing if the cod came back, but it would be a major experiment. But fundamentally, I just think showing that there is a decline from about 80% to 40% of fisheries that are overfished or potentially overfished in a period of 20 years is just astounding. And again, happy story we don't hear about. These are two examples. There are about eight more I could have pulled out where despite the sixth extinction, and I think there is a sixth extinction going on, uh, and there are variations depending on where you live, we're doing some things right. Um, lastly, I wanna just mention that we know we can do this. And we can know we can do this not just because wildlife, which I focus on, can, can recover, but because some of my colleagues have done other works. So I've talked about the Keeling curve, but there's another data set that my predecessor, Gene Likens, has been running for 53 years as well, 54 in June, um, and that's acid precipitation. And this was discovered when they cut down an entire drainage in the, in the Hubbard Brook Forest in New Hampshire. And lo and behold, the water coming out at the weirs that caught all the water coming out of the drainage was acid. They couldn't figure out why. And so then Gene and a guy named Herb Borman tracked it back to Midwestern coal plants. And they coined the term in 1972, acid rain. And then that led to uh, initially uh, the 1990s, uh, we, we really revised the Clean Air Act and acid precipitation, well, precipitation got much less acidic. There are issues with buffering in soils and how fast lakes recover and all that. But this shows a really nice action response curve where we did something in policy and it changed the world. Right? And I think it's really important. When I was talking to Ralph Keeling, I was saying, you know, wouldn't we love to see this, you know, sorry, you know, wouldn't we love to see this turnover in our lifetime? Right? And it's not impossible. It's unlikely because carbon dioxide takes a lot longer to get out of the system but it's not impossible. So we've done it with acid rain. Um, there's a paper that came out uh, eight, 2018, I think January or February, looking at air pollution success stories in the US. Gene's on it, Gary Lovett, who also works with us on it, uh, Tim Sullivan at UNH, Charlie Driscoll. Uh, and again, they just went out to look and see what we could find. And sure enough, if you look at air concentration of lead, it's gone down radically. Again, we got rid of lead and gasoline. Um, uh, Sox and Knox has gone down and that's acid. Uh, if you look at, at a different uh, indicator of acid rain, same as the one I just showed you. Uh, Big Moose Lake in the Adirondacks, uh, various things going down. Uh, pH is going up, that's good. Uh, sulfur dioxide's going down, Al aluminum's going down, and the, um, uh, oh, A and C, it's in my notes. Um, uh, anyway. Um, and in the Great Smoky Mountains, what you see is ozone concentrations that drop below the national standard. Right? The Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act are remarkably successful. Right? And they have done their job when we've enforced them. Right? And again, it's a question of do we come up with regulations that are reasonable and rational and make the world a better place? And I think we can. I think it's really important. This paper came out earlier this week. Um, and it's by, again, some old colleagues of mine at the Wildlife Conservation Society. And what they argue is that through time, populations are likely, there is a high variance scenario that has us going to 
15 or 16 billion people by 2100, but most likely popula human populations are going to level off or start declining as they have in the developed world. And as a result of that, populations go down through time. Urbanization increases, which has a really interesting impact because on the one hand, your household supply, so smallholder agriculture declines rapidly because people aren't living on the land. Your market demands because of consumption go up, but you can manage that somewhat better, not well, but better, uh, through agricultural intensification and other forms of agricultural change. Right? And we can talk about those some other time. Um, and that income per capita goes up and then consumption goes up as a result of that, but that too levels off. So in the same way the population goes up and then levels off or comes down, at some point people don't keep consuming more as they get richer, it levels off. So there will be a bottleneck. All of these things, population, consumption, uh, urbanization, land use, will create a bottleneck over the next 50 years. But eventually, we get through that bottleneck, and they're calling that, when that happens, and you'll notice that, that on these four graphs, they don't have a time, right? Because it would be a fool's errand to try and predict when it will happen. But rationally, we think we will get to a point where we have a breakthrough. And boy, I wish I were going to be alive for that. I don't think I can stretch out to 2100. Uh, my daughter would be 95 in 2100, so maybe. Grandkids looking likely. Um, but, but fundamentally, I think we should be optimistic because as a, as a community and a society and a global community, we are doing better and better and we're trying harder and harder. And there will be setbacks, but uh, they're just setbacks. Um, thank you very much. We have time for questions. We've got a unique opportunity to yeah. pick his brain. What, what does that bring to, in, in your very predictive uh, look into the future, what does that breakthrough going to look like? So, I think the earliest signs of that breakthrough already have happened in Europe and North America. We are shifting our land use quite significantly um, so that we have more forests now than we did 100 years ago. Uh, we've got less pollution now than we did 100 years ago or 50 years ago or 30 years ago. Um, we got climate, we got flooding, we got climate change, we got all sorts of stuff going on. We got species compositions shifting in ways that we cannot even imagine. But fundamentally, I think we have seen that we can have that breakthrough from the perspective of open space preservation, of land use preservation, or land use, rational land use planning, where again, 100 years ago in New York State, uh, we were like 85% agriculture, and oh my God, they were growing, trying to grow stuff on you know, glacial till. Right? And the only thing I've been able to grow, grow on glacial till is poison ivy. Right? And it's not a good thing to use land in the Catskills or even on the east side of the, uh, sorry, the west side of the Hudson Valley. Most of it, except for in the alluvial floodplains, is, is really bad soil. And now it's being used for other things and for forestry and we're, we're rebuilding. So I think that then amplifies as other areas. So Latin America is now urbanized and we're seeing recovery of wildlife in some areas, loss in others, right? Because again, we're losing a lot of aquatic resources in the Amazon as we dam rivers to get energy to feed the cities, right? But I think it, it, looks, it, it looks like livable cities, sustainable cities, urban networks. So we have an urban network that basically goes from Boston to Washington and moves south a little bit now. Uh, and well, I mean, again, this is where you guys come in. I think planning is, if not the, certainly a critical variable in thinking out about what the world will or could look like 20 or 30 years from now than trying to get developers, particularly who have a time frame that is somewhat longer. Um, you know, they got bank loans to pay off, but, but it's somewhat longer than state government or local government where, you know, if you're getting elected every two to four years, it's really hard to think long term. So that's the kind of thing I think we'll see. I want to thank you for uh, being optimistic. Um, I don't think you've convinced me, but it's nice to hear. Um, I've seen projections for the growth of the Sahara, uh, where 30% increase mm -hmm. in total land coverage um, within, if not my daughter, my granddaughter's lifetime. Right. And, um, I saw that in terms of, of the ref, UN refugee issue, uh, and what that's going to mean politically. But what about the sea rise? Mm -hmm. What about the coastal areas? That I have not been convinced that anybody has good firm evidence as to when mm -hmm. the warming of the sea 
is going to slow down enough that we can honestly say that coastal cities are safe. Coastal cities are not safe. Full stop and statement. They will not be safe. Coastal cities are not safe. All right. Uh, the two things that are really driving that is, you know, a vast majority of the heat we put into the atmosphere gets absorbed into the ocean, which is why seas are warming. And it's one of those, again, one of those things. And they're warming by a couple degrees, but that's centigrade, not Fahrenheit. So they're warming by four degrees, not two degrees. The Arctic and Antarctic ice sheets are melting faster than we thought they would, and that's not optimistic. Um, and so I think that the costs for the next 100 years, if tomorrow we start pulling carbon dioxide down, right, not just level it off, but pull it down, the costs will be disproportionately borne by coastal cities. And what is it, 80% of the world lives on the coast. Right. So the disruption to human settlement is going to be pretty significant. Now, the Dutch have shown over the last couple centuries that when land values are extremely high, you can make interventions that protect small areas. Holland is tiny, right? And much of it is, about a quarter of it is under, underwater and has been for a long time. But the, the adapt and retreat model is going to be much more likely in about, well, I don't know, I don't know the percentage, but conservatively 80 or 90 percent of the coast. And I think that is where, again, planners are, are going to really be disliked. Because you guys are rational, you believe in data, you're going to model it, you're going to see GIS projections that say there's a 15 percent probability that, you know, this floodplain will be here in 10 years. And, you know, you're going to have to bring some bad news to the politicians and to the people and no one's going to like it. So uh, I'm optimistic only because I'm trying to look out much farther. And I'm trying to see that we will, you know, I, I, it's not unlikely if we don't do what Al Gore said we should have done 20 years ago and really pull this back uh, quickly, uh, we could have fried the planet, right? And I think we are not going to fry the planet, right? That's the good news, right? And I think that some of the things we share the planet with will do better because they're much more adaptable at leaving, you know, when the coast moves, Eight miles inland, they move eight miles inland. But I think, you know, to that end, I, I think planning for the future and, you know, we're going to look back at the response to Sandy and to Katrina and be either horrified or amused, depending on our sense of humor, about our inability to recognize reality. And, you know, I remember there was a proposal to flip, for those of you who are at the APA, they were going to flip the Audubon Park and the Ninth Ward, because Audubon Park is pretty high up and Ninth Ward is very low down, and the social dynamics around doing that because the Ninth Ward is dominantly African American, dominantly poor, and uh, it's home. Right? And this issue of translocating people, in New York we had the same thing with the Rockaways, right? Predominantly working class, predominantly uh, uh, you know, people who did not have the wealth to move anywhere else in New York, which is one of the most expensive cities in the world. So they're rebuilding in places that, I don't know, 10 to 50 years time frame will be hit again by an even worse flooding situation. <sighs> you know, so I can be a downer if you'd like. Um, <laughs> but I think what we have to remember is that the actions we take today have huge impact 30, 50, 100 years from now. And that's what we can do. And it's a pity that people were not listening to people who were you know, raising this flag in 1987 when we first started talking about the biological impacts of climate change. And it was not yesterday. This problem has been identified for a very long time, and it is just finally gaining global momentum to do something about it. Um, you will notice if you go to the UN website, uh, there are about 40 countries that have committed to a carbon-free energy future. About 32 of them are small island nations. Right? It focuses your attention when you're getting flooded right? uh, in a way that nothing else does. So we'll get there, but not, not quickly enough. Um, other questions? All right. One of the um, co-benefits of the acid rain solution of right. smokestack scrubbers and catalytic converters has been the reduction of uh, nitrogen coming out of the atmosphere, which in Chesapeake Bay is now shown to lead to significant reduction of nutrients, nitrogen coming into the Harmful algal blooms, all those good things that we hate. Right. And, and so, 
So I wonder what other co-benefits you could imagine of, of, of reducing CO2 in the, in the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to speculate on the fly because if my staff heard me speculating on the fly, I run an organization which is driven by people who think about questions like if you were to pull back CO2, what would be the nutrient impacts in forests, lakes, and streams, right? That's what they do for a living. But I think clearly there would be some significant impacts, right? Um, in, and some of them would be nonlinear, right? I am reminded of uh, a proposal to get rid of, um, uh, oh gosh, this is a brain hiccup. Um, that wonderful grass from Egypt that is uh, not papyrus, uh, um, that's it, every wetland in Phragmites. Phragmites, right? So there was a proposal to pull all the Phragmites out of the Hudson wetlands. And then somebody started looking at the carbon impact of doing that, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And there are some really bizarre things with both, you know, non-native species and impacts of, of trying to mitigate one thing and causing something else to get worse. And so my guess is with CO2, there are going to be some places where increased CO2 has had a positive benefit on yield, right? And that will reverse And when we do this. And, and as long as we also reverse the Sahara, I didn't answer the Sahara question, but yeah, I've, I've spent time in Mali and it's not pretty. Um, and that's a whole nother, the way we deal with refugees certainly is going to require a little more enlightenment over time. Uh, fortunately, many of the developed countries are in population decline, so I think they will, for economic reasons, become more enlightened, if not anything else. But it will take, again, it will, it will take getting through the current cycle, right? Um, but I'm assuming rationality, which is a crazy thing to do. Uh, question? Kind of related to the question about um, sea level rise. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the area and in terms of the ability of global fish population to be able to. So the level, you're saying, how resilient are we globally? Yeah, are we going to be able to, because, you know, they're going to just run into seawalls. I mean, All right. Pretend I'm Ronald Reagan. I'm going to give you an example <laughs> and then go from there. So we've just finished a study on the Hudson where we do a lot of work. And looking at the wetlands, if you look at the sedimentation in the wetlands from Albany to the city, New York City, what you see is the upriver wetlands are capturing enough soil through time to grow at a rate that will keep them above sea level rise. But the ones downriver, if they're not paid, well, we, you know, the, the, we, we do a pretty good job of protecting them, um, but yeah. Well, so as I said, but that's not a that's not a that's not a climate change threat. That's a human you know uh, uh, development and, and expansion of human impact threat. Um, but interestingly, this is where those perverse things happen. In 1880 something, uh, we created the Catskill and Adirondack State Parks, and inside what they call the blue line, dem demarking the parks, uh, the parks were forever wild, and you couldn't cut trees and you couldn't put in golf courses on state land. That has led to a tremendous recovery. And the reason that we created the parks is the Erie Canal and the Hudson were getting sedimented up so quickly that the, the cost of dredging had gotten so high that they needed to reduce the sediment flow. So in a perverse way, the success of the Catskill and Adirondack parks has driven, you know, has deprived the Hudson of the sediment flow it needs to recover its, its wetlands. Globally, I'm much more worried about things like mangroves and the rate of migration of mangroves. But again, that's pretty good. Mangroves you know, move, can move pretty quickly. Uh, seagrass can recover pretty quickly. Um, I think the driver is going to be people and what we tolerate. And I think the first time we get massively flooded, we won't tolerate much. The third or fourth time, people will have to move. And it's just, again, it's a complex dynamic of flood insurance. Many countries don't have flood insurance, and as a result of that, they don't have the same hardened edges on their cities on coast, or, or, or towns on coastlines, right? Because you know, nobody's paid to rebuild them, and so they move back when they get flooded. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether I can predict, but I think it's going to be a very complicated. I don't think you can do a global analysis because the, the variables are so different in each country that you really have to do bottom up and, and sort of do a fractal analysis that builds. Um, and I'm sure somebody is doing it, but I'm not. All right. Last one, and then I want to be on time. And even though I started late, I don't want to end late. So in a way, you're talking about um, shrinking, like that planners have to go 
go from knowing how to grow to knowing how to shrink because if you're moving from the coast inland or moving from the rural areas to the urban areas. So, just like you do with your... So rural to urban, absolutely, your shrinking footprint, right, and, and per capita footprint. I'm not sure that the, the migrating people is necessarily shrinking. It's just recognizing the coastline is going to be in a different place. But it's more like all the infrastructure, if you could move it. Yeah, okay, so, so this brings me to my architect brother, and I have this argument where he is designing to move things up to the second and third floor because that way when buildings get flooded, the water flows through and then it flows out, and all the, you know, all the services are up high so they don't get destroyed. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but they were built differently they back built then. Different. They were built in ways that, that they tolerated. Number one, they were much smaller. Right? You know, the average house was nine hundred square feet, not nine thousand square feet. Right, and and so there's that. But I'm not. I think part of it. I think going becoming urban, we definitely use less land, although we chew up land that is now not being used. But moving, I I'm not sure. I, I think there may be just. Uh, over the next couple hundred years, you know, it'll be like I, I have a house in the Catskills and I, I see the former site of towns that are now somewhere else because New York City bought up a whole bunch of, uh, condemned a whole lot of land, flooded it and made the best aquifer system and, and water system in the world, right? But it had a cost and the cost was moving some of those towns. Multiply that times, you know, a million in, in terms of scale. But, but I think we're going to be saying there used to be villages and towns here and there aren't any more and that town is now here instead. Um, I think thinking about renaming places is really powerful, but that's a social question where you don't give it a new name, you give it the old name so it's still home. Um, seems to work a little better, not a lot, but a little better, right? All right, thank you very much. Thanks, guys.